everyone. I see that it's the top of the hour, so we will go ahead and get started. So good afternoon and thank you for joining the Superior Health Quality Alliance Roundtable Conversation. My name is Elena Baer and I'm joined by my colleague Jerry, as well as our guest speaker today, Dan Mercer from Visit Health. For those of you who have been joining these meetings for the past few weeks or even past year, welcome back. And to those of you who are new to the call, we are so glad that you're here. We host this one hour session on the second and fourth Wednesday of the month. And the first half of the presentation is typically a didactic presentation. And then the remaining time we leave open for a Q&A session. Besides learning from our speakers, you have helped your fellow nursing home leaders on this call. In the past, you've shared resources and strategies and we continue to encourage you to do so throughout the call. One thing that I would ask is that you think about any pebbles in your shoe or things you are struggling with or trying to figure out. If you can send me a direct message in the Zoom chat or please put your suggestions in the survey at the end of this session, we would greatly appreciate it and do our best to incorporate those things into a future presentation. Jerry will put the link for the PowerPoint presentation into the chat momentarily. And please use the chat box to share any comments, questions, or anything else that pops into your mind during this presentation. And we'll use that for a discussion during our Q&A. The presentation today will focus on pneumococcal disease and vaccination. And Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elena. And I'd like to thank SHQA for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, <clears throat> Today, as Elena mentioned, we're going to be talking about pneumococcal vaccines, pneumonia, and resident care, and uh, some changes that have gone on to the guidelines for those vaccines. If you could go to the next slide, please, Elena. So the objectives for today are to understand and be able to define the difference between pneumonia and pneumococcal disease, understand the difference between communicate acquired and hospital acquired pneumonia, and what's changed in the naming convention there since 2016, Understand the new options available for diagnosing and treating pneumonia. Understand Streptococcus pneumoniae, the diseases it causes and their impact. To understand the different historical types of pneumonia vaccines and to understand and utilize the current vaccination guidelines by the CDC and use the state registries and select the proper vaccination for residents and patients. The next slide, please. So who am I? Uh, my name, as was mentioned, is Dan Mercer. I'm a pharmacist uh, trained at Ferris State University in Big Rapids, Michigan. I'm currently the National Clinic Director for Visit Health, and I direct vaccination efforts at the company, and I'm responsible for long-term care and community sales, marketing, education, and clinical activities. I also manage the lab activities at Visit Health in conjunction with our internal and external lab partners. And at various points in my pharmacy career, I was a pharmacist with a concentration in infectious disease and currently call that my hallmark skill set and experiential adjunct facility for St Ferris State School of Pharmacy, where I would train uh, pharmacy students. And in particular, the concentration, again, was in infectious disease and a clinical pharmacy manager and vaccination trainer for pharmacists. I think many of you will remember back, oh, about a decade ago when vaccinations uh, first made their way into pharmacies where previously pharmacists did not do this. And um, I was part of the first wave there to train pharmacists on how to evaluate a patient for what vaccines they need and then administer those vaccines. In the interim, I've administered literally thousands of vaccinations both before and after COVID. And the next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with some tenets of infectious disease. And um, these are my personal beliefs and are intended for discussion. I'm sure, you know, with many of the things I talk about today, um, I encourage you, because I do have an academic background uh, somewhat, to um, look at the information for yourselves, make your own evaluations, um, ensure that you're doing what you think is right for your patients, not that you ever wouldn't. But with, as with any speaker, when I listen to someone else, um, dig into the, the information a little bit. Find out you know, how to color your own view of this so that you can treat your residents in the most effective way possible. And oftentimes that part of that treatment is communication in particular with vaccines. 
Um, there is vaccine hesit hesitancy out there. Some of it is well earned. And the best thing that you can be for your resident is an advocate for some of these vaccinations with family members who might be hesitant or with the residents themselves if they are hesitant. So some tenants I operate under. <clears throat> First, the only good infectious bug is a dead one. And what I mean by that is any bacteria that causes suffering in human beings is a target and should be treated as such. The second tenant is that dead bugs don't create resistance. So what that means is when we make well-educated, targeted antibiotic selections for an existing infection that are effective and kill the pathogen, we do not create resistance. Where we do create resistance is if we don't wipe that infection out. Next, the only thing better than killing a bug is vaccinating against them. And the only thing better than vaccinating against the bug is preventing their spread in the first place. Now, that's a nice goal, but it's not always possible. And we'll talk about some of those reasons a little further on. And I'll put a, you know, put a little asterisk there. Um, I'm a pharmacist by training. So what does that mean? I know drugs. You folks know how to actually treat people. And we talk about disease prevention in a facility. <clears throat> that is by far your area of expertise relative to mine. So something to keep in the back of your mind while you're in the facilities and something a pharmacist certainly is gonna preach at you about. If we could go to the next slide, please. So starting from the most basic case, what is pneumonia? Pneumonia is an infection of the lung tissue. And when a person has pneumonia, the air sacs in their lungs become filled with microorganisms, fluid and inflammatory cells, and their lungs are not able to work properly. When <clears throat> I was an intern, I had a physician explain this to me as um, pneumonia is an infection of the leaves, whereas something like an upper respiratory infection is an infection of the trunk and branches. So <clears throat> pneumonia is far deeper into the lung and far harder to treat in many cases. If we could move to the next slide, please. The diagnostic criteria for pneumonia. I'm not going to read through all of these. I'm sure you're familiar with them and you can refer to the slide if you'd like. The, the presentation will be available. Um, <clears throat> what I will say is that um, when we get to the point of septic shock with the need of vas for vasopressors or respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation, well, the horse has left the barn at that point. We are way down this path and we have a resident who is in deep, deep trouble. If we could move to the next slide, please. So pneumonia in general is a problem. Per a study from 2015, it was the leading cause of death for adults 18 years of age and older. That's from the New England Journal of Medicine and you can check that reference if you would like. Next slide, please. Now here's where some of the confusion comes in. Because of the similarity of the name to the disease state, into a couple of the pathogens, it gets confusing. Here's the example. The most significant pathogen for pneumonia is Streptococcus pneumoniae. And the disease that it treats is right in, the, or that it causes, one of them is right in the name. And that's the one that we're specifically addressing in this presentation. Pneumonia can be caused by any number of other pathogens, a number of which are listed right there on the left side of that chart. Respiratory syncytial virus, other bacteria with pneumonia in the name. So mycoplasma pneumoniae can also cause pneumonia. Um, chlamydia pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, Pseudomonas, other bacteria you may be familiar with, a number of viruses and even uh, fungi. If we could move on to the next slide, please. The causative agent for pneumonia if we were to take you know, and, and examine what's the causative agent for all of the pneumonia cases that we see, over time, it shifts with age from say mycoplasma pneumonia or respiratory syncytial virus or one of the other causes towards strep pneumonia. So the incidence of pneumonia caused by strep pneumonia increases over time as you age. And the range that the National Institute of Health gives is that 36 to 49% of pneumonia cases in the elderly are caused by strep pneumonia. The next slide, please. Now here's the real problem. 
Culture and sensitivity as a diagnostic criteria for pneumonia can be unreliable. In truth, culture and sensitivity as a diagnostic criteria for any infection can be uh, unreliable. In areas with poor vaccine penetration, strep pneumonia will be isolated or detected by PCR with the thresholds removed. That's getting a little technical, but basically we're opening up the PCR to really find what's in there 70% of the time. The PCR evidence is so overwhelming that it points to the following. You're colonized, I'm colonized, and everyone is colonized at some baseline level with strep pneumonia. And if you're not vaccinated, you are likely sort of a hotel for strep pneumonia. Pneumococci are common inhabitants of the respiratory tract and may be isolated from the nasopharynx of five to 90% of healthy persons. Now, that's a pretty broad range there from five to 90%, but what it really tells you is it's all over the place. If I have a range so wide when I find this, then, you know, at random, I don't know if you're the type of person who does this, you're walking through the mall and say, well, just ballpark, one out of every two are colonized with strep pneumonia that you're walking through the mall and, and meeting every day. The next slide, please. Now, we're not just vaccinating for pneumonia when we use a streptococcus pneumonia vaccination, but that one gets the most press. The major clinical symptoms caused by strep pneumonia are pneumonia, bacteremia, and meningitis. And the vaccine will cover all three disease states. And when I refer to the vaccines, the one in particular we're gonna talk about most today is PCV20. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what are the different types of pneumonia that we're gonna run into, at least in practice, as a pharmacist, maybe more than you know someone who works in long-term care all the time? Well, um, the folks who have got written guidelines have divided this two ways. You have healthcare acquired pneumonia now, or hospital acquired, healthcare acquired, and uh, community acquired pneumonia. Community acquired has a given set of criteria that basically mean you are not institutionalized, you have not recently spent time in a hospital, um, and you're just, you know, the average Joe out in the population and caught pneumonia on the fly. Pretty much everyone that we are going to deal with in a long-term care is going to fall under HAP or hospital acquired pneumonia. And the naming is still a little confusing because, and if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, there previously was healthcare acquired pneumonia. So what's the real difference? In hospital acquired pneumonia, which includes everybody in a long-term care now, resistance is assumed. So we are going to assume right off the bat that we are dealing with a pathogen that has acquired some resistance factors. And that broad spectrum antibiotics are the first choice of treatment with might, might be termed the nuclear option for vulnerable patients with assumed bacterial pneumonia. What does the nuclear option really mean? Well, there are three types of bacteria. One are the gram negatives, two are the gram positives, and third are called the atypicals. The gram negative and gram positive refers to the structure of the cell wall of the bacteria and how a gram stain colors that cell wall. Because there are those two types, they're pretty easy to, to separate out, at least mentally. The third type are called the atypicals, and they're called atypicals because they don't have a cell wall at all. So in the selection process for antibiotics, we tend to take those three types of bacteria and, and think of them a little differently. Um, when I'm selecting antibiotics for patient, if I'm doing an empirical selection and I'm looking for the nuclear option where I want to get everything because I don't know exactly what I'm dealing with at that point, to kill everything gram negative, I'm going to use something like levofloxacin or piptazo. So that's going to cover the entire spectrum of gram negative bacteria that are likely to cause pneumonia and have very little incidence of resistance against them. Or in the case of piptazo, have a beta-lactamase inhibitor with them that will defeat the beta-lactamase enzyme that some of these bacteria carry. On the gram positive side, I would probably select vancomycin or if um, we wanted a little bit easier 
course, we might use linazolid. Linazolid is an oral antibiotic and does not require trough measurements. And then we also want to kill everything atypical. So everything that doesn't have a cell wall that might cause pneumonia, like mycoplasma pneumoniae. And those are the drugs like levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, even azithromycin is favorite, uh, fairly effective at that. Now, one thing to remember when I'm dosing this empirically, these are not nice drugs in some cases. Vancomycin in particular is rough. Uh, it causes kidney damage, it causes hearing damage, and it is a narrow therapeutic index drug. And uh, reference here for this is the management of adults with hospital acquired and ventilator associated pneumonia. And that's a 2016 clinical practice guideline. That's where you will see this quote, nuclear option, you know, uh, laid out in front of you. In community acquired pneumonia, you're probably going to see a selection of, of antibiotics that are nowhere near as serious. So that's when, you know, we think about pairing an azithromycin with maybe a first or second or even a third generation cephalosporin oral antibiotic, where I've got the azithromycin on board to take care of the atypicals, but I have the cephalosporin to cover everything else. So now onto uh, the change in the guidelines from 2016. Everyone in a long-term care is assumed to have HAP if they're diagnosed with pneumonia. This was the previous definition of HCAP. And I bring this up because when you say, well, someone's in a long-term care, hospital-acquired pneumonia isn't the first thing that comes to mind. And when they changed this and they merged the categories of HAP and HCAP in 2016, it caused a little bit of confusion. I still am gonna see a lot of patients in a long-term care facility where we're going to have pathogens that are demonstrating significant levels of inherent resistance to antibiotics. The next slide, please. So back to the previous concept of taking care of pneumonia patients. We talked about preventing the spread in the first place. I'm not the expert there, you guys are. Since you can't always prevent the spread, vaccinate. And if the resident or patient still ends up with pneumonia, begin treatment qu quickly. Empiric antibiotics are okay when the need arises. And we can start with local resistance patterns if we wanna to begin to narrow early. What does that mean? Um, hospitals and every infectious disease department in a hospital in your area maintains what's called an antibiogram from their infectious disease department. These antibiograms, if you, if you are a little persistent or you catch the infectious disease folks in the pharmacy, are widely available and they don't protect them. So if you can get in touch with them, they will give you the antibiogram for your area. And the antibiogram basically demonstrates out of, for instance, let's say a hundred strep pneumonia infections that resulted in pneumonia, how many of them demonstrated resistance to, for instance, let's just say amoxicillin. And you'll get a percentage there and you can make an educated guess as to an empiric antibiotic choice if the patient's not quite so serious and we don't think we need to elevate all the way to something that requires, you know, really careful follow-up like a vancomycin. If you have any questions about how to do that, I can help you get that information. My contact information is at the bottom of the slide and I would be more than happy to do that. Second, <clears throat> we want to identify the pathogen and what is it it is resistant to as soon as possible. We're now moving away from empiric and we're moving into, okay, we're gonna target down that antibiotic selection to get the bug that we know that is really there. Now, I mentioned culture and sensitivity takes three days. That is the best lab in the world doing it. I can get you that information in 24 hours. And the way we do it is via PCR. So we have a respiratory pathogen panel. It is far more precise than a culture and sensitivity. I think all of you will be familiar with the idea that cultures and sensitivities sometimes give bad results or no results because they are contingent on the quality of the sample that you received and what can grow. PCR does not work that way. If the pathogen is there, we will find it and we'll find it in 24 hours or less and we'll tell you what it's resistant to and we can tell you what antibiotics would be best to be used in that case. And finally, pick the right antibiotic. 
when we started empiric, we're going to start broad spectrum. Once we find out what the pathogen is, we're going to narrow that <clears throat> spectrum on down to get something that doesn't have as severe of adverse reactions, isn't as difficult to monitor, is hopefully an oral antibiotic, and will take care of the patient quickly. If you could move to the next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about Streptococcus pneumoniae um, in particular. So it's a lancet-shaped gram-positive facultative anaerobic organism that typically appears in pairs. And we've got a nice picture of what this looks like under an electron microscope. So what does all that really mean? Well, gram-positive, that's good. There are lots of effective antibiotics uh, against gram-positive bacteria. And one of them in particular that wouldn't be the first one that would come to mind is often strep to cocci are susceptible to just plain old ven penicillin. And penicillin, in the words of the professor that I had in pharmacy school, is an absolutely exquisite killer of streptococci when used properly. Everybody sort of thinks penicillin is really weak, and I'm not necessarily recommending it for any particular case, but penicillin has been demonstrated to have streptococci num uh, streptococcus's number when we're treating it. Um, <clears throat> also, when we're talking gram positive, you know, the first antibiotics that went into general usage were really targeted against gram positive um, bacteria. And bacteria on the gram positive side of the spectrum don't tend to carry a whole lot of resistance factors. So, you know, people get chills up their spine when they hear, the, you know, a patient has a Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection. Part of the reason is because Pseudomonas has some pretty nasty resistance factors that it can genetically carry. Same thing with E. coli. They um, carry this genetic information with them. They manufacture uh, enzymes that break apart antibiotics and gram-positive bacteria don't tend to do that a whole lot. So sometimes they're easier to kill. Now, pneumococci cause more than 50% of all cases of bacterial meningitis in the United States with approximately 2,000 per year. And then there are over 150,000 hospitalizations from pneumococcal pneumonia annually in the United States. And it has also been shown to complicate influenza infections. So you have a resident who gets a flu infection and then it's followed up piggybacking right off that is strep pneumonia moving in and colonizing the patient causing a further uh, add-on infection. And as I mentioned previously, as we age, the percentage goes up. So I'm in my mid fifties now, I can look forward to, you know, that chest cold that I had when I was younger, probably viral. Well, it's got a better chance as I approach my sixties and seventies of being strep pneumonia. Now there are a hundred different serotypes at least, and I'm sure that number has gone up since of streptococcus pneumoniae, and they're identified by surface features and that'll become important in a minute. If we could go to the next slide, please. So in the beginning, we're gonna talk about the vaccines now. Well, it's not really the beginning because the really early ones are irrelevant. So this is sort of the beginning. The first commonly used pneumonia vaccination was PCV7. And <clears throat> in the naming convention for these, the number on the end of all of these, and I'm gonna to refer to them all by the generic names instead of their brand names. The number, refers to how many serotypes of strep pneumonia, meaning how many different types of that bacteria surface features, and, and they're, remember they're defined by their surface features, um, are covered, and there were seven of them. Here's the important thing that I want you to remember about PCV7 when you're talking about your residents. If your residents receive PCV7 as a pneumonia vaccination, you can ignore it completely when doing the evaluation for what they need. In other words, just simply pretend it never happened because it's not part of the decision process. It covers so few serotypes that the CDC has said, well, we're not even gonna make like it exists. One that's more common that you're going to see nowadays is PCV13, which was just recently superseded. And <clears throat> this covers then 13 serotypes of strep pneumonia. They're all listed there. We won't go those, those um, in particular. And here comes some of the confusion. PCV13 is considered in the vaccination history of the patient. PCV13 vaccination history will affect your choice of which vaccine your residents ought to get 
and um, the timing of them. So we wanna keep that in the back of our minds. If we could go to the next slide, please. Well, then we have PPSV 23. And PPSV has a slightly different mechanism of action in that it mimics the surface antigenic features we described earlier that define the serotypes. And the, the human body antibodies then react to those antigens and immunogenicity is reduced in the immune compromised. This is very, very important for long-term care. PPV, PPSV23 is a very dubious efficacy when you're dealing with a patient who is immune compromised or elderly. Previously, before the next two vaccines that we're gonna talk about, the gold standard was PPSV23 plus PCV13. And then you were considered completely clean. I want you to note the overlap. So PPCV13 and PPSV23 share a bunch of serotypes. So if you got both, effectively you got double vaccinated for serotype one, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then here comes some more confusion. PPSV23 is sometimes considered in the evaluation of a resident for their vaccine status. And again, I want you to remember this, this is quite vitally important. Despite the vaccine's reduced effectiveness among immunocompromised persons, PPSV23 is still recommended for such persons because they are at increased risk of developing severe disease. With, with every medication out there, it's risk versus reward. So if I was, you know, a few years ago going to immunize somebody for PPSV23 who was immune compromised or um, elderly, I was making a risk versus reward calculation that this vaccine is extremely innocuous. We have 40 years of history behind it and what type of adverse reactions you can expect, which are at the end of the day, a sore arm and that's about it. Um, but there may be enough of an upside to say, yeah, it's reasonable to give this person this vaccine. Finally, there is no consensus regarding the ability of PVSV23 to prevent non-bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia. For this reason, providers should avoid referring to PVSV23 as a, quote, pneumonia vaccine. And I'm going to apologize for every time in this presentation, because I've been doing it for over a decade now, that I refer to these as pneumonia vaccines. They are pneumococcal vaccines, but gee whiz. I'm, I probably screwed it up a half down a dozen times myself. So my apologies that, that happened. And then I'm, of course, forgive you if you do that in the future. If we could go to the next slide, please. So now let's talk about the new vaccines. The first one is PCV15. Uses the same technology as PCV13. That's great. Better than PCV PPSV23. And it falls into, that's really neat, but why would we do that category? It provides those two more serotypes, but no clinical advantage whatsoever compared to what was recently re released. And if it is used, the vaccine schedule then requires the use of PPSV23. I can buy PCV15. I actually have a box of that at, at, in our fridge at our office in Grand Rapids. It's not going into anybody's arms. In, in his, anybody's arms. They sent it to me on the hopes that I was going to give somebody a shot with PCV15, you know, within a couple of years, and it's just not gonna happen. Um, and I'll, we'll all see why in just a minute. So if we could move to the next slide. Here's the newest vaccine, PCV20, and this is the only time you'll hear me use a brand name. That is Prevnar20. It is the same general type as PCV13, and it covers seven more serotypes than PCV13. It makes PCV15, PCV totally irrelevant. Now that PCV20 exists, just take PCV15 and do what I did, push it to the back of the refrigerator or your mind and never worry about it again. If you are evaluating somebody who had PCV15, well, then I guess we would have to worry about it, but it's gonna be pretty rare. Per Pfizer, these additional strains cover 40% more of the total pneumonia cases caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae in the country. So that's a pretty good boost in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in efficacy versus PCV13. If I can, you know, cover 40% with those seven serotypes, 
of the infections that we're going to see from strep pneumoniae, that's a good thing. If we could move to the next slide. So where's the confusion? New shot works better. Everybody gets it, right? Well, no. PCV20 changes the consideration significantly. The next slide, please. For adults who are age 65 years of old or who have not previously received a dose of PCV13, PCV15, or PCV20, you can give them one dose of PCV15 or one dose of PCV20. And if PCV15 is used, this should be followed by a dose of PPSV23 given at least one year after the PCV15 dose. So I want you to understand what you're doing if you're the person that wants to use that box of PCV15 in the back of the refrigerator, you're gonna make those people get another shot. However, if you just give them PCV20, which is widely available, you don't have to do the second shot. And I've done vaccine clinics where you know I've had people getting four or five shots at one time. So if we can eliminate some of that shot load, well, that just makes life better for everybody concerned. And remember down here at the bottom, if you previously received only PCV7, just follow the recommendation above, use PCV20, okay? If we could go to the next slide. Now, for someone who previously received only PCV13, well, you're gonna give them PCV20 at least one year after the PCV13 dose or complete the PPSV23 series as re recommended here. And that's a, a link you can click there. Let's just give them the PCV20 because then we don't have to worry about PCVSV23 series at all. And that's multiple shots spaced out over years. If you previously received only PPSV23, you could give them one dose of PCV15 or you could just give them PCV20 one year after the PPSV23 dose. If you use PCV15, well, then they have to get PPSV23 again. The next slide, please. If you pre previously received, or your resident patient previously received both PCV13 and PPSV23, which is most, most folks, but no PPSV23 rece received at age 65 years or older, one dose of PCV20 at least five years after their last pneumococcal vaccine or complete the PPSV23 series here. Again, give them PCV20. If you previously received both PCV13 and PPSV23 and PPSV23 was received at age 65 years or older, a large majority of the residents in nursing homes are gonna look exactly like that. Based on what's called shared clinical decision-making, one dose of PCV20 at least five years after the last pneumococcal vaccine dose. Okay, that's nice. Let's move to the next slide. Here's a chart, set of charts. And, and you know, at this point, if you're in the audience here and you're starting to get a little frustrated, I, I appreciate that because there's a whole bunch of if then going on here and we've got multiple charts. And we can move to the next slide if you would. Oh, we got even more charts for folks that uh, might be immune compromised or have a cochlear implant or cerebrospinal fluid leak. And you can follow these charts also, they're there. And we can move to the next slide. So here's the important thing. We talked a minute ago about, <clears throat> you know, the ideal resident in long-term care that is just 100% up to date on all of their vaccines, except now PCV20 has come. And they're fully vaccinated. They've got every PCV13 they need. They've got every PPSV23 that they need. But if you notice what the guideline said, the guideline said by using, quote, shared clinical decision making, we can decide to give them a PCV20 and be in compliance with the guideline. Well, what does that really mean? And I'm going to read this verbatim to you because this is how the CDC explains it. Shared clinical decision-making vaccinations are not recommended for everyone in a particular age group or everyone in an identifiable risk group. Rather, shared clinical decision-making recommendations are individually based and informed by a decision process between the healthcare provider and the patient or parent slash guardian. The decision about whether or not to vaccinate may be informed by the best available evidence of who may benefit from vaccination, the individual's characteristics, values, and preferences, the healthcare provider's clinical discretion and the characteristics of the vaccine being considered. There is not a prescribed set of considerations or decision points in the decision-making process. 
So basically, they're encouraging you to have a conversation with the resident if they're capable of it or with the folks responsible for their medical decisions about should we give them PCV20. Now, I'm going to give you a, a very uh, personal example and what my recommendation would be. My mother is 83 years old. Um, she has some kidney problems. She would be considered immune compromised at this point. And given what I know about PPSV23, I would have a conversation with my mother that would say, I think PCV20 is a good idea for you. Well, you're immune compromised, so PPSV23 probably didn't do what it was supposed to do. The risk of getting a PCV20 shot is extremely low. Again, same technology as PCV7, which has been around forever. <clears throat> and I think the benefit is pretty important in light of the fact that as you age, mom, you're going to become more and more susceptible to pneumonia caused by streptomonia. And that would be the decision process that I would go through. If I had a patient who had PCV13 and PPSV23 and was extremely vaccine hesitant, maybe wasn't immune compromised, didn't want to do it, was generally in pretty good health, you know, at that point, shared clinical decision making says, well, maybe we don't recommend to do it. Um, those are the types of conversations that I think it's absolutely vital to have with either a patient or a resident or the people responsible for these folks' health care. Um, and when you have the background information in front of you and you can personalize the case, maybe um, the way I just did it is a possible example. I have two different people in front of here and I can show you risk versus reward for my mom, 83 immune compromised versus risk versus reward, somebody who's 65 and in great health or is 67 and in great health. Well, you know, at that point, that's the two things that can color those, those decisions. So I would encourage you to have those types of conversations with your patients and residents. If we could move to the next slide. So I fully understand the idea that my description of these vaccines and the charts and all of the if-thens that I provided for you. Um, if I was to give myself a test on this presentation, I'd probably fail it on um, what the recommendation should be. So I would like you to look up here at that link right there. That is an app for your phone that you can click on right there and install on your phone. And you can enter through that app, the characteristics of the patient you're talking to, um, when they got what vaccine, which you can look up in the state registries pretty well. And it will tell you in accordance to those guidelines, what the appropriate vaccine is for that patient. Um, that uh, I think was just an absolutely brilliant move by the CDC. I think it dawned on them that, oh my gosh, this is the worst decision tree that we've ever seen in our lives. So why don't we make an app and we can do that. And in the immortal words of Einstein, you know, Never memorize something you can look up. And this is the ideal way to look that up. If we could go to the next slide. That is the conclusion of the presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and open this up for any questions that you guys would have. Thank you so much, Dan. That was a great presentation. I totally agree. It's definitely complex to try to figure all that out. And I know you're out in the field quite often and you mentioned that you were hearing from a lot of long-term care facilities that they were confused by this too. So I just ask for all of those who have joined us today, if you have any questions, feel free to, first of all, always feel free to unmute yourself to ask them, but also put those into the chat and we can read them aloud. We'll give everyone a couple seconds to do that. And maybe I'll even ask them some questions that if you're still trying to think of what your questions are, how many of you have been really focused on that um, PCV20, especially when we're looking at vaccine fatigue? I'm sure we're all kind of starting to see vaccine fatigue in the long-term care setting, uh, just because there's been a lot of rounds of COVID vaccines and the annual flu shot. So how many of you have been really focused on that PCV20 vaccine? And put some yeses or noes in the chat. All 
All right, Kimberly says, we have been adding it to our protocol and immunization tracker. That is excellent. Who else is doing stuff like that? If our residents have 13 and 23, we usually do not give 20. Are you finding that it is more difficult for um, your residents to accept the pneumococcal vaccine or vaccines in general just because of that vaccine fatigue? Jenna says they do the same as Sue. Sue is saying yes, that it is more difficult. I really like, Dan, how you framed kind of having those conversations too. Um, I think that was really helpful to hear your personal story as well. Thank you. I think um, with a number of the conversations that I've had with residents and folks responsible. Um, <clears throat> I think being able to personalize it with, you know, your own story helps a tremendous amount. And then, you know, folks really appreciate just sitting down and explaining things. Um, and as we all know, you know, Dr. Google is often terribly wrong and has caused a, a terrible amount of misinformation to be out there. Um, but we can do uh, good things just having simple conversations. And I know everyone is busy, so. I see some other things coming through this, the chat so I can give some background information as well. I know in the state of Michigan, we were struggling with finding uh, mobile vaccine uh, clinic partners. And actually we partnered with Dan and Visit Health to provide that to facilities in Michigan. So first off, if you're interested and are in need of a free mobile vaccine clinic in any of the three states, but especially in Michigan, please feel free to reach out to myself. I'll put my information in the chat so we can get you connected with the Visit Health team or a different mobile vaccine provider in the other two states. Um, but I see something in here about vaccine fatigue, more so with staff and influenza vaccine. So Dan, since I know you sometimes go into the facilities, do you have any suggestions for how to help out with, with more having the conversations with staff? Um, <clears throat> conversations with staff. So, and I might go a little far afield here, Elena, but um, these are some observations that we've made. We spent a lot of time in long-term care. Um, many of the conversations, many things going on with staff now, I think are directly related to the fact that finding staff has become extremely difficult in retaining staff. Um, a lot of that came out of COVID. Um, a lot of folks retired. If you look at the demographics of the country, that is going to do nothing but get worse. And there, I think, is a good amount of fatigue on the staff's part because, you know, the folks that you have now are likely your more de most dedicated folks. They're going to stick it out and keep working with you. And <clears throat> in light of that, you know, it, it's difficult sometimes to bring something like a vaccination to the forefront of your mind when you have an absolutely immediate need that has to be taken care of. You're running understaffed because we can't get staff and um, difficulties come up that way. I, you know, spending time in long-term cares, long-term cares are just like pharmacies and then there's nobody standing around doing nothing. So it's, you know, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, you hit the door and you hit the ground running. And I think it's difficult sometimes to, to keep the entire picture of the things that have to be done over a long period of time versus what has to be done right now. And the phrase that I use to, to, to illustrate that is, you know, the bus that's going to run me over today is more important that the one, than the one that may run me over in two weeks or a month or six months. So if I've run into vaccine fatigue from staff, um, as far as administering, it's because they're already 
pretty heavily worked, as they said. If I've run into vaccine fatigue from the idea of, oh my gosh, we're getting shot after shot after shot after shot, um, I think as healthcare providers, as people who take care of people, um, we are partly to blame for that, in that um, we have not exactly covered ourselves in glory with um, explaining the efficacy of certain vaccines, addressing what adverse reactions really exist. And um, that's why I encourage, you know, the audience here to look at the references that are there. <clears throat> if you have um, any of the vaccine boxes, you know, in your facility, every one of them has a package insert. And you can pull that package insert and you can see within the package insert exactly the science that was behind the idea that made this efficacious. And then, you know, make your own decision. And if you say we have somebody with PCV13 and PPSV23 already, you know, and we want to encourage them to give PCV20 because they might be at high risk, you know, those tools are there to provide you with the information. You can make your own evaluation. You certainly not tell somebody to, you know, suggest something they don't believe in. And I have the happy accident in my life of that, you know, I have the opportunity to make the decision of say something that's going to happen for an elderly person. And I get to put my mom's face on every person that's there. And, you know, come to that decision process with the idea of, if this was my mother, would I do this? And if I can't answer that, yes, I would do this, that gives me you know, significant pause, that I would need another way to consider thinking about that. Did, did I answer your question, Elena? I think so, yes. Thank you so much, Dan. You're welcome. I saw another question in the chat too from Tabitha asking about, has anyone used the CDC app to guide decision-making or conversations around vaccination? Well, if, if nobody else answers, um, I, I would certainly like to hear from somebody else. I certainly have. And, um, you know, once, and I've probably given, you know, a thousand PCV20s now and done a thousand, you know, thousands of evaluations of nursing home, long-term care residents. Um, that's one of the um, responsibilities that falls on me when we do a vaccine clinic at a long-term care. You know, I pull everybody's state registry record and point-click care information if I can get it. Um, and I do use that CDC app. If once you, you know, do this three or 400 times, it becomes second nature. But when you're doing, you know, your first few, that app is incredibly powerful. And also, um, you know, if I needed to, I would pull it up in real time um, with a resident or a patient and have that conversation with them too. So I have done that, yeah. So much, Dan, and I apologize if you can hear my dog barking in the background oh, that's all right. in my front door. But um, I will say to I know that um, Jerry posted an evaluation into the chat, and we really appreciate everyone's feedback um, so that we can find more great speakers like Dan um, to come on and provide some expertise. So if you wouldn't mind taking that for us, we'd greatly appreciate that. And we will leave it open for a couple more minutes as well in case anyone else has any additional questions. Um, we really, really appreciate all the education. This will be a recorded presentation that we will put up on our YouTube in case you want to refer back to it. Um, but you should also be able to find those slides in the chat. I'll post them one more time um, to refer back to as well, because I know there are a ton of great resources and education and things like that posted in the slides today. Um, so with that, I'll offer everyone a few more seconds to ask an, any additional questions while you have an expert on the line with us today. So um, please feel free to unmute yourself or add anything into the chat.
not hearing anything. I think we can end the call a little bit early. Dan, again, we so appreciate you joining us today um, and providing the education on the pneumococcal vaccine. Uh, and we see some thank yous coming in through the chat right now. Please reach out to me, like I mentioned, if you're in need of a mobile vaccine clinic. Um, those are especially focused on COVID-19, but I know Dan's team can come in and help out with influenza and pneumococcal vaccines as well. Um, so please reach out if that's something that you're in need of. Uh, and with that, we will end the call and we really appreciate all of your attendance and we will see you here again uh, in two weeks. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Have Bye. a great day, guys. Bye.